in the workshop, part six of a diabolical model steam engine. After retapping the front cylinder cover mounting holes 5BA, the time has come to solder the motion bracket back together and fit it in place. As shown in a previous episode, here is the wonderful, beautifully made motion bracket that's been soldered together a few times. I showed in a previous episode how I cleaned the part using cellulose thinners and a toothbrush. The part is still in the tub of cellulose thinners, so by now I think it should be clean. This is the end of the cylinder without the piston fitted. The threads in this cylinder are not very good, or at least they don't match the actual machine screws used to hold the cover in place. It just rotates. Time, I think, to re-tap the holes 5BA. I'm running this part of the video at four times normal speed, just to get through it in a reasonable time, because tapping one hole is pretty much like tapping any of the others, and it does get tedious. The original threaded holes in this cylinder were very oily, and that is a good thing when tapping holes in metal. You will notice in this clip that the front cylinder cover has two gaskets. That's possibly because it was impossible to tighten it fully using the original machine screws which were a rattle fit in the threads. This engine is owned by a young man by the name of James Evans and he called me yesterday to ask me what thread am I going to use on the steam chest so he could order a displacement lubricator. I'd already mentioned that I would rebuild this engine and make it work but it's not really going to be very suitable for regular running, and I'm not going to repair it again. I would never accept a job of repairing an engine in this condition. It really is diabolical, as the title suggests. But to answer the question that James asked me at a very inconvenient time when I was reversing my car into a parking space, this thread will be quarter by 40 threads per inch. It will be threaded and also soft-soldered into the steam chest cover. At this point I would just like to say I never use soft solder anywhere near a steam engine. Its melting point is far too low. Time to look now at the piston rod gland. Here's the piston rod that I made sticking out of the cylinder. And as you can see, if you look in the hole, there is an O-ring. And now there's another O-ring on the piston rod. In the end, I fitted this piston rod with three silicone O-rings. In this clip you can't see the third because it's inside the gland and it's covered in steam oil. I'm going to preempt any questions about why I'm using three silicone o-rings in the piston rod gland and two silicone o-rings in the valve rod gland. Some viewers may be wondering why I'm not just using graphited yarn. I will explain the logic behind this in a future episode. But I will give you a clue, it's to do with alignment. And now, James, it's time to contain your excitement because I'm going to perform a quick test with the glands in place to see whether they leak as I test the engine to see how the piston goes in and out relative to the valve. There are plenty of leaks around the cylinder cover, around the valve chest. The good news is I don't see any leaks around the valve spindle or the piston rod. Although the piston rod gland could do with tightening slightly. There's quite a lot of air blowing past the valve inside the steam chest, but I haven't looked at that yet. It's on the agenda, but I need to get a little bit further on before I become concerned about the slide valve contact in the port face. The piston appears to work. That's a success. It's just the rest of the engine I'm worried about. Time now for a festival of soldering really bad components. This is a shot of part of the parts I'm going to solder and a tub of Frylux paint, which is a mixture of ground up solder and flux. Which leads me now to top tip time, not the series, just a single solitary top tip. This is an antique caliper, it's very old, I've got a box full of them, and in this case I'm using it as a clamp. And as far as engineering accessories go, these are still valid. I can still get very good accurate fits by using one of these. But they do have a good secondary function. They're an ideal clamp for holding parts together while soldering. I could use a proper engineer's clamp for this job, or a spring clamp. 
but this is better because the mass of metal touching the part that's been soldered is so small and it will conduct negligible heat away from the joint. It's a good tip is this and I've used it frequently. What I'm doing here is using my small Proxon blowtorch to heat up the parts. When the solder melts it will change colour from grey to silver and I should have quite a good joint. The broken part on this side was a perfect fit back in its original position. But the one on the other side wasn't and when I tried to clamp that it would not line up so I'm going to use a different method for the other side. There's quite an excess of soft solder and it's running out of the joint. I cleaned that up using a paintbrush. Before attempting to solder the other side I left this part in this position for about 10 minutes to let it cool thoroughly. I didn't want this part to fall off as I was soldering the other side. Which I'm about to do now using a different method. I'm holding this part using a pair of surgical forceps. Why am I doing this? Well because the original part doesn't fit perfectly in the right position. It's broken and bent and it's been like that for a long time. I straightened it out the best I could by tapping it with a hammer which I haven't shown. Now as I solder this part I carefully hold it in position using the forceps making sure it's perfectly in line with the other one. My method seems to have worked because the crosshead slides up and down the guides without any friction but then again there shouldn't be much friction as it's a rattle fit. In this clip the crosshead guide bars are sat in the correct position but nothing's bolted down yet. I need to fit an exhaust connector and this is going to be tricky. The hole in the centre of the exhaust is not in the centre of the exhaust so I'm using a drill and applying quite a lot of pressure to the right hand side. Health and safety warning, do not do it this way. I'm using an end mill in the drill. This can be very dangerous because it will jump around. You have to hold the drill really rigidly. I managed to get the hole deep enough and square enough to thread. I then threaded the hole 5 16 by 32 threads per inch to suit this commercial double steam union. Before I finally fit it, I'm going to machine it a bit shorter. Then I will soft solder the threaded part to the cylinder, which will provide a little bit more mechanical strength. Currently, all of the moving parts on this engine do not align with each other. So I'm going to tackle that in a future episode, as I mentioned earlier. All I'm doing so far is making a construction kit, a very bad construction kit, but at least one without any broken parts. In a previous episode, I drilled these holes in the bed plate clearance size for 4BA. Then I countersunk the holes underneath, and here I'm using two countersunk 4BA bolts, one at each side, to fix the motion bracket in place on the bed plate, but there is a problem. The motion bracket does not sit perfectly vertical, so what I'm going to have to do is make some adjustments to the flatness of the bottom of the motion bracket because at the moment it leans towards the cylinder as you can see here. I'm not going to do that just yet. I'm using this out of alignment to test the strength of my soldered joints by fastening the crosshead guides at the left hand side near the flywheel. The good news is the solder joint is strong and it remained intact once I tightened the two bolts which pulled the crosshead guides down onto the mounting. It is still very much a diabolical steam engine, but it's marginally better than it was. That's it for now. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for watching, and as always, I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my main steam models website, and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.